The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome tonight to tonight's MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar. These webinar series uh, deliver pertinent topics to beef, sheep and goat producers in Australia. My name is Peter Havillant and I work for the Webinar Coordinators Aggregate Consulting. Tonight's topic is effective communication on farm. Um, we're lucky to have Sally Murphy from Inspire Ag to join us. Before I get into uh, the webinar and, and the topic tonight, I'll just quickly step you through uh, the go-to webinar control functions. So the most important thing there is that, that arrow. You can minimise that so you can have a full screen view. Uh, bear in mind also you have the ability to ask questions. So I'll monitor that. Feel free to send your questions through uh, during the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. Uh, and yeah you'll be on mute, so we can't hear you, uh, you can hear us. If you have any uh, technical difficulties, please use the question function as well, and I'll do my best to assist you. So uh, before we get hand over to Sally, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Obviously, uh, as farmers nowadays, we have to wear a few different hats and managing people and relationships is a key part of, of you know, running any business, uh, inclusive of farm businesses. So we've got Sally Murphy in to talk about communication, which is obviously an effect, you know, a really important part of business management. Sally, born uh, in Tasmania, uh, a farmer's daughter. She's got extensive experience working with farm and agribusiness companies. Uh, she's got a great little quote, in her intro, a good boss lights a fire inside people, not under them. So, you know, again, building, you know, culture and, and finding solutions that fit the agri-sector is, is her passion. So I think that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over now to Sally. Uh, the final slide here I'll put up at the end. There are some further resources available in relation to human resources and communication. So I've just listed them there. And uh, a reminder, we always take these webinars, so they will be put up on the website two to three days later for you to refer to in the future. Uh, the final point before I hand over will be, we really value your feedback um, and, and take it on board to choose future topics and to improve this product. So we really appreciate if you just take literally two minutes at the end uh, and complete the survey. All right, that's enough out of me. Sally, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, bear with me. Sorry for the delay, guys. There we go, Sally. You should be able to see the controls now. Perfect. That's Alrighty. Good. Thanks, Sally. All right. Well, um, yeah. Th firstly, thank you to to Peter for organising uh, this webinar. It's uh, it's a great honour to be here to talk about a topic that I am super passionate about. So I'd love to begin today's tonight's session by um, asking you a question and that question is what if the way that you naturally act, think, act and communicate was having an impact on the profitability and performance of your business and what if I told you that that impact could range anywhere between 30 and 200 percent and that that comes from all wasted time, it comes from wasted money, resources, rework uh, that you might have to do because the job's not done the way that it should have been done or even not even to mention the impact that it can have on um, your relationships that you enjoy within your business. Problems like this are the main reasons that I get called into people's kitchen and boardroom tables. So in this webinar I want to talk to you about uh, three key areas. The first I want to talk to you about is 
some of the external factors that are impacting on agricultural workforces and the ability, more importantly, the, the ability to attract and retain talent. I want to tell you a bit of a story throughout this about as a real life scenario with a client uh, here in Tasmania um, and about how communication had had a serious impact on humans and business in this particular scenario. And then I want to discuss with you five key points for improving communication in a way that builds culture and relationship in a way that helps you build labour efficiency and also helps improve the, um, the productivity and performance of your business. So let's start by looking at some of the external factors. In agriculture, we talk a lot about the ability to attract and retain staff. And in my experience, there's one, this is one of the main three reasons that clients don't expand or develop because they can't find the right people to drive that investment. And in fairness, this has been a long standing issue in the industry and it's going to get even more challenging. What you're seeing here on the screen is a, a, a graph that come out of the agricultural appointments report that they recently released, um, which is titled the 2022 Salary and Trend Report. And what you're seeing is a graph indicating the supply of candidates in comparison to the advertisements that have been placed on uh, a job platform such as seek.com.au. It's ranging in dates from July 2013 through to July 2021. And you can see right at the where it's almost like a big open mouth, you can see that in July 2021, it showed that there was approximately 425 job advertisements. And in that time, there was only about 100 candidates that were available to undertake those, that role. One of the other external factors that I want to talk to you about is demographics. This is something that's actually really important for us to understand as agricultural employers. The first thing I want to talk to you about is that um, the average age of, the, of an Australian farmer is 57 years old. And when you look at the average age of Australian farm managers, our farm managers are actually about 12 years older than any other profession across the Australian economy. And at the moment, there is a changing demographic. So our workforce is now comprised of about just over 50% millennials. So these are people that are in the age range of say mid twenties through to late thirties. So to emphasize the millennial part a little bit more, the, when um, more that, given that they're more than half of our workforce pool at the moment, I think we need to do a lot more as an industry to understand who they are, how they operate, for example. So when you look at millennials, what we understand from the data, they, it tells us that a lot of millennials are choosing to work casually or part-time. And one could make the assumption that this is for uh, reasons that they're raising, you know, they're in that age group that are raising families. A millennial actually stays about two and a half years in a role. They have potentially five different careers and throughout their working life will have approximately 17 different employers. So that old adage of a job for life just doesn't ring true anymore. Understanding this information helps us to identify strategies that can help us build better workforces. So for example, we can look at things like job design. So, you know, do we need somebody coming in the gate at seven o'clock in the morning and, and making their way out by, by five o'clock or six o'clock? Is there an opportunity there for us to look at job sharing, for example, or are there other ways that we can actually get the job done without having to uh, require a person there for that, you know, for a full-time role, for example? But also looking at communication and generational styles, which I'll touch on a little bit more in a moment, but I think this is really important that we, we start to understand um, these things. One of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about is workforce composition. So agricultural workforces, as we know, have changed quite, significant, quite significantly uh, over a period of time. 
So traditionally, our workforces looked like the triangles. We had the triangle. We had a we had a few owners. We had lots of operators. So think farm hands, um, two ICs, those sort of things. Um, and then in the middle, we had a few managers and we had a few paraprofessionals. So the paraprofessionals are things like agronomists, animal health specialists, or nutritionists, those sort of roles. But as we've transitioned into this diamond structure, you can see that uh, we are requiring more people in that midsection. So in the future, the people that undertake these roles, they're still gonna need to have those technical and the production skills and still be happy to get their hands dirty but they'll also need a greater emphasis on some of those soft skills like communication and the ability to build relationship to help lead manage and develop people as well this slide here represents the industrial revolution in comparison to the hr evolution so previous revolutions have uh, had significant impacts on how the industry operates. And as it's transitioned from, an, from like mechanization of the first revolution through to mass production, automation, and now an industry, what they're terming industry 4.0, um, you know, we're looking at that, that next phase, which is the internet of things. So historically, our agricultural workforces have had, I suppose you could say, a rather authoritative way about how they lead and manage their people. So a bit carrot and stick approach, or to put it in another way that I'm sure we'll all understand, if you don't like it, son, there's the gate type of um, scenario. Our modern workforces, though, are much smaller, they're more specialised. And because of um, those specialised skills uh, as a result of changing production skills, we also need to look at the way that we lead and manage our people as well. So here's where I wanna tell you the story. This was a couple of years ago, I got a phone call from a client who I, had, which left me literally scratching my head. The client, um, the, the conversation went something like this. Sally, I need you at my kitchen table at two o'clock on Tuesday. I need to sack a bloke. So I um, fast forward to this day. I, I said to my clients as I sat there at their kitchen table, look, I'm prepared to help you, um, you know, exit this person from this from your business. But first, I want to understand what's led you to this point where you need to get rid of them. Because up until this phone call or the phone call that I had a few days prior, everything had been really positive. I'd been involved in the recruitment of this particular guy and yeah, everything just seemed to be going rather well. So for about an hour, I sat there and I listened to everything that the uh, client had to say, their, their dirty, the dirt list on everything that was wrong with this employee, everything ranging from poor behavior, inappropriate conduct, um, a number of heated exchanges in the stockyards, um, poor communication, they were getting lengthy responses to emails and text messages late at night, phone calls during the day despite having issued instructions on a, on a um, task list app that the, the employee had actually been a part of implementing into their business when he came on board a few years earlier. So. The client had actually pulled out his phone and showed me a text message and he said, this is the sort of SHIT that we have to deal with. It was a six line text message delivered about 10.30 the night before. So from their perspective, from the own client's perspective, the employee was being, I don't know, lazy and entitled, uh, super difficult. So in their mind, they had he had to go. After the client had finished giving me his, his rundown on, on everything that was wrong with this employee, I asked him one simple question that changed the entire course of the conversation. And what I asked him was, have you ever considered that this employee has difficulties with reading and writing? And there was a really long, awkward silence. The husband just about dropped his cup of coffee on the floor. I'm glad he didn't because it was a tile floor and it would have made a hell of a mess. Um, but after that long, awkward silence, uh, he, he 
started to talk to me and he said to me, he said, you look, look, you know, we actually have a son who's in the private, in a private education system. He has challenges with reading and writing, but we didn't see this. And this was literally right underneath our nose. So if we rewind this conversation a little, a few months earlier, I'd actually been working with these clients to um, understand what was going on in their business, how we could improve efficiency, et cetera. And so we was working on some strategic human resource management projects. And as a part of that process, we had decided that we would be doing a 360 degree review process. So this gave everybody in the business, including this uh, employee that had challenges with reading and writing, the opportunity to have a bit of a, um, a bit of a reflection on how they were going in the business, what needed improvement and essentially how we could fill those gaps. So given that we were doing this 360 degree review process, this actually gave me the perfect avenue to have a conversation with the employee about what was going on from their perspective. Now, when I do 360 degree review processes, what I do is I generally give the person that I'm interviewing a sheet of paper and it's simply just to keep some notes on um, what we agree upon in the conversations, um, just so that it, it's there for reference later on. As I sat there in, that sh in the shearing shed um, that particular afternoon, I slid that piece of paper across the room to the employee and I asked him just to pop his name on the, on the tops there so we knew that it, these were his notes. And his hesitation in writing his own name, a simple five letter word, was enough to confirm to me that in fact, this was the problem that we were dealing with. In that moment, I gently asked him if indeed he did have challenges with reading and writing and he cautiously confirmed with me that that was in fact the case. As we sat there that afternoon, I worked through with him and to, to understand from his perspective, what was going on for him. And for the most part, what I heard was that the, the behaviour that the employer was experiencing was largely coping mechanisms for the employee. Ironically, the employee had actually pulled out his, his phone and showed me that same six line text message that the employer had shown me a few, um, few days beforehand. And he said to me, he said, how long do you think it took me to, to write and send this particular text? And I looked at the text and I, I sort of thought, you know, maybe about, you know, five or 10 minutes by the time you draft it and then um, proof it and send it, uh, press the send button. And he said to me, he confided in me that that text message actually took him 25 minutes to write. So he could read and write, but his proficiency in that area was something that was um, causing him some significant efficiency. Um, you know, there, there was a waste of, of time and resources being, being had there. It was what the employee told me next that will stick with me forever. As a parent, it literally broke my heart what he told me. Despite living on the property and literally being 200 meters from the shearing shed every mo every morning he would cut his lunch he would make his way out onto the farm do his jobs and he would eat his lunch in the shearing shed and make sure that he didn't return home until after seven o'clock because he knew by that time that his ch his young children would be in bed and that he wouldn't have to risk reading them a bedtime story he, late, he also divulged to me that uh, overnight what would happen after he got home from, from work, he and his wife would sit down during the evening and respond to any of the unactioned emails or text messages that have happened throughout the day. So tidy up any loose ends. And so, you know, he, from his perspective, he was being super efficient by doing that and not wasting the employer's time. But from the employer's perspective, um, you know, it was all those things about being, you know, lazy and self-centred and entitled and all those sort of things. So I guess, ladies and gentlemen, what I want you to, to, to do is to, you know, if you have a situ situation like this in your business, is to look at, the look at this situation through a different lens. 
the employer was able to adjust his lens in this particular case and the employee went on to serve this particular employer for another 12 months before moving on to another business. As a consultant, I would estimate that around about uh, probably 15 to 20 times I've seen this same situation, of course different context but to, and to varying degrees, but I reckon I've seen that 15 to 20 times in the last 12 months alone. So now I want to go on and talk about um, those five different areas that I uh, spoke about at the onset of this presentation. The first one that I want to talk to you about is self-leadership. So this to me is such an important ingredient in building a safe, productive and profitable workforce culture. There's a, a saying that you, uh, before you can lead others, you need to learn to lead yourself. And that for me just rings so true. There's a, there's a, uh, there's research out there by an organization called Gallup that says that the, a leader, a team leader can have a variance of 70% in team engagement. And so this is to say that the energy that you bring as a leader to your team can have a positive or a negative impact on the team performance and that can be quite significant. So you might be asking why is team engagement actually really important? Well for, for one thing um, team engagement builds psychological safety and that's another one of my my favorite topics but team engagement is actually really important because it helps um, reduce absenteeism. So um, there's a reduction of about 81% in absenteeism. There's a reduction of about 64% in safety incidences where a team has team engagement. And on the contrast, if, you, if there is no engagement, it can have an impact of 18% on productivity and also a 23% uh, reduction in profitability as well. So the way employees are treated by their leaders and also how a team engages with each other and how they treat each other can have a significant positively impact uh, on, your, on the business. So, I mean, it's a pretty simple formula really. Better engagement equals better business outcomes. So the second one I want to talk to you about is culture. So culture would have to be one of the most undervalued aspects of running a successful farm business. I describe culture as, I suppose, kind of like a bailing twine that keeps everything together. And others say that it's the privilege of staying in business. So success in your business is determined by how you show up, how you, what you tolerate, and how you manage underperformance. So when I'm working in a client situation, I like to work them through this tool called above and below the line. So what you can see here is simply a line that's running through it, above it, you're looking at ownership, accountability, responsibility. Below the line, you're looking at blame, excuses, and denial. So if you're operating above the line, your responses to a situation might be, how could I have communicated that better? Were the right policies and procedures in place? Or what could I as a leader done differently? If you're operating below the line, you're essentially using a shame and blame style of leadership. So you're saying things like, he didn't listen, or this task failed because, or, it was their fault. I think as leaders, it's really important to understand one thing is that we as humans are hardwired for protection. So there are, we are hardwired for that fight or flight response. So even with the best intentions, we can all drop below the line at some point. This is normal. But what I'm encouraging you to do is to think about how quickly you can actually get yourself back up above the line and respond in a way that's going to help you uh, increase the performance and profitability of your business. The third thing I want to talk to you about is communication. Teams that foster good communication, 
these teams are always, always, always the ones that grow to their full potential. There are studies out there that have shown that businesses who or team leaders who communicate well involve employees in making decisions within the business that are beyond their role. These businesses outperform others by about 30%. So it starts with, in my mind, having quality conversations. <clears throat> Excuse me. No one likes having those difficult conversations, um, but the benefits, I can assure you, will far outweigh any discomfort that you may feel. Taking the time to understand your each team member's communication style is something that's really important and vital for building stronger relationships that achieve better outcomes. So at the very basic level, to determine how to best communicate with your team, think about the members of your team and ask yourself, where, where do they do their best work? Or where do they do their best thinking? Is it out loud? Is it on the spot? Is it on the paper? Is it drawing some lines in the dust on, the, on your window, for example? Are they introverted or are they extroverted? What type of tasks or meetings do you find that they're most energized in? And do they, do they best process information in writing or is it verbally? Being clear about your expectations in a written format is actually really important as well. So having things in place like employment contracts, position descriptions, policies and procedures, codes of conduct, et cetera, are really vital uh, for a successful business. There's an author out there called James Clear, and he's written a book called Atomic Habits. And one of the quotes that I love that he says in that book is that you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. So taking this a little bit further, if you want to get a little bit more technical, technical about understanding your the communication styles within your business, is the utilisation of a personality tool. Now, I'm just going to pop up on the screen there. A this is a, an example of a one that I use. Now, this uh, whether it become whether it's uh, performance or whether it's attitude or productivity or turnover, I often find it comes back to personalities. So this framework here is one that I use by a, a lady called Alison Mooney, and she's published this in her book called Pressing the Right Buttons. Now, I want to emphasise that there are heaps of frameworks out there, such as the Myers-Briggs and DISC, etc., that can really help you understand and dig down into how somebody operates and how they are most effective. This one speaks to me, so this is the one that I utilise. So a very quick and dirty um, communication style lesson here. So uh, pressing the right buttons, um, says, Alison says that there are four different personality styles. There are playful, powerful, peaceful, and precise. So in a stressful situation, a playful, I think, you know, it takes a lot to stress them out because, uh, but when they blow up, it's usually over and done with in their mind at least. I'm a playful, I can attest to this. However, what a playful can be unaware of is that the, the debris that they leave behind in their little outbursts. Powerfuls when stressed, powerfuls default to working harder and preferably the more physically demanding that hard work is, the better in their mind. Anyone who annoys a powerful will often become a target. I'm sorry to the powerfuls out there. But when a powerful blows up, you best run for cover, people, because it's not going to end well. A peaceful in a stressful situation is probably one of the most adaptable styles here. So a peaceful, I happen to uh, be in a relationship with a peaceful. And so for somebody like my partner, Peter, he is not affected by, or is very little affected by external environments. So he needs harmony. He needs, he will go to any length to keep the peace um, and he'll withdraw just to avoid attention. And if you're precise, these are the types of personalities that worry and internalize things. So have, um, they have a great ability to recall information uh, that can also create stress for them because 
they play a mental gymnastics trying to interpret and sometimes misinterpret what's going on in a situation. So this framework or any other personality framework that you choose to implement in your business is excellent for understanding how others think, act and communicate but it also helps you as a leader to become aware of the impact that you have on others in your work environment. Employee engagement. So employees who show up every day with passion, purpose and energy are always going to do more than what is expected of them. In contrast, a disengaged employee, so the type, of, the type of employee that's only going to do enough to stay off the boss's radar, the, the difference in contribution between a, an engaged employee and a disengaged employee is what's called discretionary effort. So you can see here on this slide that leaders who make, <clears throat> pardon me, leaders who make employees central to their business strategy, that give their employees clear expectations and provide them with the tools to track the tools to do their best work outperform every single time those leaders will see a significant reduction in absenteeism or on the opposite of that presenteeism so the type of person that turns up to work but is not really there in inverted commas um, and also a reduction in employee turnover if you have to replace a disengaged employee, it can cost your business around about a third of an annual salary to replace them, but also to bring a new person up to speed. So if you're looking to build engagement in your business, you could be looking at things like um, organising an impromptu lunch or a smoko, for example, providing them, your employees, with an opportunity to contribute to the business beyond their role. Um, celebrating their birthdays, milestones, anniversaries, things like that. And also just, just even as simple as giving them a genuine compliment or um, a thank you for a job well done. Now the generational understanding is number five on my list and I promised that I would come back to that. So generational dynamics, I would say, would be one of the top three reasons that I get called in to support clients it frustrates me no end as a consultant when the older generation are saying that the younger generation are lazy and self-centered and entitled and then the younger generation on the flip side are saying these people are dinosaurs and they're stuck in their ways and they're just too controlling over everything I began researching what defines each generation and what motivates them and I come up with an earlier version of this graphic here. So if you're interested in looking at this a little bit further, you can see there McCrindle. If you searched communication and generational drivers, you'll come up with this graphic and a, a supplementary graphic as well. But what it looks at is the generational differences of each um, in terms of technology, the leadership styles that were implemented, what influenced them as young people, even the prime minister of the day, for example, and even the way they were marketed to. So my message to you out there is that don't gossip about each other. Take the time to understand the richness of, I suppose, experience and perspective that each generation can bring to a business and help you build productivity and workforce participation. So I want to leave you with these thoughts this evening. So my main message is that success shouldn't be entirely measured by the amount of time that you spend in the paddock or the yields that you achieve. It really should be about the relationships that you enjoy. If you're looking to increase the performance and therefore the profitability of your enterprise, it's essential to focus on these things. Self-leadership, again, learn to lead yourself before you can lead others. Value culture, what you, how you, be, what you believe, how you behave, how you decide impacts on team performance and therefore profitability. Operate a systems and process driven business. 
you don't need to be wasting time um, worrying about um, how to manage a particular situation, particularly in a performance management situation, when a policy or a procedure could have got you out of the trouble that you might be in. My fourth piece of advice out of tonight's session is to hire the right people and get out of their road. I have a saying in the work that I do that if you are the smartest person in the paddock, then you're probably in the wrong paddock. And my fifth one, my last final point for this session is that you should, should learn to value the whole person and not just the part that makes you money as an employer. So I guess in a nutshell, my belief is that people are the power of agriculture. Take care of your people and the people will take care of your business. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Sally. That was great. Um, I really like the stories, uh, the anecdote you gave and, and, and the infographics are great. Um, so I'm just going to put up my screen, guys. Um, give me two secs and we'll get into some questions. So I've got some that have come in. I'll get straight on to them. Uh, now, uh, first question, Sally. Uh, which personality style uh, or the personality style diagram you put up, where can we find that source? So that comes out of a book called Pressing the Right Buttons by Alison Mooney. Um, she has a little bit of stuff online, um, but if you're looking for a light, easy read, I really recommend you get that book. As I mentioned in the presentation, there are other personality tools that are very similar and correlate really strongly to the tool that I showed tonight. Um, and there are lots of free sources out there. So if you type in free personality testing tool, you'll come up with a, a whole um, bunch of different options. All right, uh, guys, just, and just a reminder, it, we, uh, we really value your feedback. If you uh, exit before the questions are done, please uh, complete the survey and, and we'll take your feedback on board. Uh, next question, Sally. Um, again, about that book, what was the book Atomic? Could you repeat that? It was called Atomic Habits by James Clear. All right, excellent. Thank you. Um, Sally, question. In terms of, you talked about staff turnover and costs. Uh, can you put some numbers on that in terms of agriculture? Yeah, look, that's actually a really interesting one um, that I've, I've searched high and low to try and find data that supports turnover in agriculture. And I've only really been able to find one that's come out of dairy. Um, I believe it was, um, don't quote me on this, I can, I can get you the right information later on, but I believe it was um, a paper written by Ruth Nettle. And in that in that report, she indicates something like 30% um, turnover. If you look at um, turnover from a, um, a broader HR perspective, the industry standard is about 18 to 20%. So agriculture, for whatever reason, um, does tend to be a little bit higher, but I don't have any data that backs up um, specific, um, specific facts around turnover in agriculture. But yeah, it is, it is a lot higher than industry HR standard. Excellent. All right, guys, um, if there's no more questions, I'll, we'll give it in a moment or two. But Sally, thank you uh, very much for, for that succinct summary of a, a pretty complex to topic. Uh, guys, we will meet again uh, in a fortnight's time uh, and we'll be posting, you know, the extended program up uh, on the MLA website. So. Uh, thank you again for your attendance tonight. Uh, Sally, thanks again for, for your input and, and the great presentation. Have a great night, everyone.